Uh, whoops. Thank you, Mark. Uh, appreciate it. Um, we are here. Uh, I appreciate everyone joining us today to spend just a little bit of time talking about um, uh, audiovisual services in a, in a more holistic method than we than we lots of times uh, re um, think of them. Uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, a well-rounded uh, and all the different elements that go into the service um, is, is not always just people and equipment like we sometimes think about it. So before we get into that, though, um, introdu introductions might be appropriate for some folks on the call who don't know us. So uh, we will start with Jeff. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jeff Lothar here. Um, uh, real brief intro. Uh, from 1980 to 1990, I was inside of Marriott Hotels working to design and have constructed all the audiovisual systems and helped with all their master design standards. And then in 1990, started Electromedia Design, um, which is a, a design and consulting practice. We don't sell it or install equipment. Uh, we work all over the world. We have over 1,000 um, engagements. So, uh, we passed that milestone a few months ago. Um, so uh, I've been active in IAC since the mid-90s and, uh, and, and truly love the, the ethic, the service ethic that IAC represents. And that, that keeps me excited about uh, working with um, IAC as an organization and, and all of the IAC members as well. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, my name is Eric Brock. Uh, I am... I've. Uh, Joined Electromedia Design in 2009 uh, as a senior consultant of AV operations. Uh, the, as Jeff said, the, the company had been in, in business for quite a long time doing audiovisual design, and along the way, uh, had noticed that uh, there was a need to uh, assist a lot of clients in and how to operate these things. So when I ended a almost 20 year career with Merritt Hotels uh, as, a, as a supervisor, manager, and director of AV services. I uh, uh, joined Electromedia Design and over the years we noticed that there, there, were, there was a gap in the industry uh, where, where people would, uh, facilities that are self-managed uh, with audiovisual services, use their own staff, use their own people, really didn't have a resource to go to. You know, we would get called into facilities on a, on a kind of a, uh, a one at a time basis, but we decided that we needed to make something that was a little more scalable, a little more accessible to everybody on a, on a larger scale. Uh, so we created uh, what we call Avastar, which is a, uh, a, a software platform that comes along with uh, additional support, consulting support uh, that's, that's available to, to folks. Um, and that's, uh, that's how I became the managing director of Avastar, which is uh, mm -hmm. a, a, an offering from Electromedia Design. I've been involved with IAC for almost as long as I've been with Electromedia Design. Um, I came to my first show uh, in 2010 and have been involved in uh, various committees and, and now sit on the board of directors for the Americas. So that's me. So a little bit about each company. Uh, Jeff, if you want to intro Electromedia. Uh, sure. Um, so that, that gives some brief by the numbers. Um, I didn't realize we had the thousand projects. I'm, we're really tickled about that. <laughs> 90 plus percent of them lodging hospitality conference centers, uh, about 30 percent of them are outside of North America. We have projects in the Middle East and Spain and uh, Greece, just got back from Greece and Sri Lanka, um, and Central and South America. Um, and uh, Eric, you want to describe Avastar? I mean, you, you Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, again, Avastar is a subscription support platform that uh, supports uh, audiovisual services and all of the different tools, resources, and and procedures that uh, need to need to happen in order to run a responsible audiovisual service. Uh, we, uh, again, you know, this grew out of our our uh, consulting practice and started we started developing we started to realize the need uh, a couple of years ago started development we began beta testing early last year and we're currently in our early adopter phase um, and really it's it's had we found something that existed that we could use and and recommend to people we would have done that but since something didn't exist we decided to to build it ourselves and and those you know that few minutes is just in a nutshell of, of our experience and and why 
we, um, you know, why we why we talk about the things we talk about, and 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 you know the way we we try to offer support to IAC membership and the industry at large. Yeah, because the activities of have, being a responsive, having an AV uh, responsive AV services as part of your operations really has activities and systems that have to be made. And we've um, in, in properties that are doing it themselves, we found they've got a combination of sticky notes and whiteboards and ex various Excel spreadsheets that they're you know, using all in combination of things. And, and it can be done that way. And, and, and that's, I think what we're going to describe is what are those elements that, that um, need to be accomplished in order to have that, what, what knits together to create responsive audiovisual services. Okay, so with that, we'll move into our topics. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to just establish off the, off the uh, beginning is, um, you know, what, what are the outcomes? What, you know, for when you, when you finish the session today, what are you going to, what are you going to understand? And, and the primary thing that we want people to understand is that, you know, event technology and audiovisual services are really a critical component of today's meeting experience. Excuse me, uh, somebody sneaks in. Um, uh, you know, the seamless use of technology to support presentations and deliver messages is it's really an expectation now it's it's no longer an amenity or a nice to have it's, it's something that people just when they show up to a meeting venue they expect it to be there be available and and be usable so to provide this experience and meet the expectations uh, requires a responsible approach to planning implementing supporting the right blend of uh, systems, equipment, procedures, and people that are appropriate for the uh, services that you need to provide. So what we're going to address today is the framework to ensure that um, venues are prepared to deliver technology services and meet guest expectations and deliver a quality technology experience. Um, so things that we, you know, uh, we will go over is what do you look for if you if you need to evaluate your current systems what are you going to look at what are the things that you need to look at you know the stuff what's the stuff you need to look at uh, in order to um, make sure that you've got the systems and equipment that you need uh, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between built-in and portable AV and the impact on the customer experience between one or the other um, understand that there is is budgeting that needs to happen for both short and long-term service maintenance and replacement which is something that sometimes is overlooked uh, we're going to talk about the key performance indicators that measure and manage um, revenues and expenses uh, and we're going to talk about the the systems needed to support the planning and execution of these technology services Okay, and here are the building blocks of AV services. And uh, Jeff, do you want to start with the environment? Yeah, sure. Um, so the environment is appropriately on the very bottom of this pyramid, and um, and that means it's the foundation. Um, we uh, sometimes say that we can't use technology to fix a bad room. The environment is is the room. Um, sometimes the room is outside, but nevertheless, there's aspects to human perception and human experience that uh, are directly affected, uh, completely affected by the environment, and we need to be looking at that. The room matters. The acoustics matter. The lighting and lighting control um, matters. We're going to get a little bit more into detail about lighting and lighting control and acoustics um, in later slides. Um, on top of the environment is the equipment. So we have the equipment that that includes both the portable and the built-in equipment. Um, there is certain systems that um, perform far better when they're built in and integrated into the environment because they're engineered to work with the uh, the room as opposed to being able to just put something anywhere in a tent or <laughs> temporarily set up. Uh, the procedures are how. Oh, Eric, you're going to do the procedures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, the procedures are a lot of times the missing layer. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times if you see this this chart, uh, you know, it, they they may it, they may take the room into account, they may take equipment into the account, and they certainly are going to take staff and, and your people into account. But a lot of times they don't take procedures into into account. And procedures are things like standards, 
uh, SOPs, uh, resources, guidance, the things that tell the staff how to interact with the environment and the equipment. Um, and, and those are often, the, again, you know, the missing link in, in the system, and those are really what are going to ensure that you have a consistent and reliable service operation. Uh, and then, of course, there's the staff, because you know, w without staff, you're just providing uh, equipment. You're not, you're, not, you're not giving anyone a service, you're just providing equipment. So the staff is key to, to, uh, d you know, to, to making it a service and not just stuff. Um, so who's going to support it? And you know, oftentimes there's there's some things to look at as to you know, do you need technical staff? Can your can your you know your other staff support it? How how complex is it? Um, you know, uh, do you, you know if you need staff, how many? You know, you know, what kind of skills do they need to have, and that kind of thing. So there's there's all those considerations to go through when when looking at at, at staff. Okay, so uh, looking, I don't see a question at the moment. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the environment because it all starts with the room. That's, that's the foundation. That's, the, that's what the experience is built on. When people walk in, they're walking into a space. They're walking into the room. And essentially, if you think audio visual, what would, what would like to do is sort of map that into acoustics and lighting for a moment. And um, there's there's a psychological, and there's actually a field of study called psychoacoustics that we study and teach, and and we need to understand um, about how does the human experience, um, how is it affected by um, the um, psychoacoustical uh, phenomenon that happened? We're completely unaware of a lot of the of the feelings and the impressions that we get. We may notice that something's going on, but we may not understand what it is. And that's where the psychoacoustics and the acoustics come in. If there are three aspects of acoustics, and what we're trying to do is to think or to teach in terms of being aware, um, listening differently when you walk into a room. And we teach meeting planners how to evaluate spaces. So that's, that's what my, a lot of people on the call are. They, that's what you do for a living is meeting planning. But when you walk into a room, what to notice, what to look for, what to listen for. Um, the background noise levels uh, coming from, generally they come from HVAC. Sometimes they come from adjacent spaces or ice machines in the service corridor. Um, but the, 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 the level of background noise, just so we understand, causes a, a little muscle in our ear called the stapedius muscle to tighten up and reduce our ability to hear and understand. It reduces our listening sensitivity. So lower levels of background noise increase our ability to get the word, get the message, talk comfortably with our, uh, understand the presenter and talk comfortably with our colleagues in collaborative meetings. Just as an aside, this also applies in restaurants where if you have high levels of noise in restaurants, um, the the brain actually starts to drip adrenaline and, and um, it changes your, your your endocrine system, your digestive system. So you don't you don't want really noisy restaurants if you want people to have a, a comfortable meal. In a in a meeting room, it it challenges intelligibility. We have instruments that measure intelligibility. We can tell what percentage of the consonants in the spoken word are actually making it from the talker to the listener's ears. We measure that with instrumentation. Reverberation is the phenomenon of sound bouncing around the room. So once a sound is introduced into a space, a meeting space, an event space, does it die quickly or does it linger? Does it hang around? Does it bounce off the hard walls or the hard floor or the hard ceiling or all of those? Um, as you can imagine, um, speakers that are on sticks, portable stands speakers that are firing their sound energy sideways actually excites that reverberant energy, the reverberant field in the room. And that creates more noise. So now we're back to point one. Reverberation is a phenomenon that causes the buildup of background noise levels. And so that's why we tend to recommend that 
um, event and meeting spaces scientifically, measurably perform better when they have low reverberation. Um, that, and, and so the sound systems work better. You need, you don't need as big uh, sound systems. You don't have to turn them up as loud, and people can communicate with each other in a lot more comfortable space. And also then isolation from adjacent spaces. And this is um, where you you hear that, and that actually was one of the drivers of the original set of design standards for IAC, because meeting planners were saying we're so tired of having movable partitions that are paper thin separating us from the meeting next door and how are we going to have um, an intimate effective meeting when we just hear people laughing or clapping or making noise in the room next door or we hear their program content so one of the things for example when if you do have flexible function spaces and most most facilities do have at least one that has operable partitions in if you want to here's a little test if you want to see whether those partitions are set properly, put the partition in place and then turn the lights on on one side and off on the other side and go into the side of the room that the lights are turned off and give your eyes maybe three minutes or so to adjust to the darkness and look to see if you see any light leaks around that partition because every light leak will be a sound leak. That's just an easy way to test and you can teach how Houseman to how to check to make sure they've got the partition set properly. And if you do see light leaks, um, maybe it's time to have your uh, partition serviced. That's just one way that sound gets over, around, or through <laughs> partitions, but it's it's the easier one to test for. And of course, portable speakers, again, portable sound systems that are firing their sound energy sideways against that partition are more likely to penetrate or get their sound to go into the room next door. So that's uh, something to look out for. As far as lighting goes, um, this screen, this image was just uh, taken last week of this, pro this projection screen. And you can see the washes of those down lights. Um, oh good, it doesn't say the brand. I will say that <laughs> this is in Greece. <laughs> All of a sudden this, I saw welcome to the family in it. Uh, th this, this is something to watch out for um, because we, are, when we project onto a screen, we're projecting light. We cannot project black. We, we can't project black. So the white that you're seeing on this screen is as black as black can get in the images that we're going to project on that screen. And if we have the screen all scalped with those down lights like this, then you have an inconsistent washed out image. So what can be done? Well, in the old days, we used to unscrew the lights above the screens. Uh, now you might ask your engineering department to have those lights on a separate circuit that can be switched off when the screen goes down. And if you really want to get fancy, you can make it so that the contactor that lowers the screen also automatically turns off that circuit of lights. So then you don't have to worry about somebody accidentally leaving that circuit on. But just like these lights are washing out the screen, so do windows and ambient light from the outside can come in. And interestingly, when we teach meeting planners, you have to consider what time of day is you, are you planning your events because the sun moves around the sky. And sometimes if you're looking at it in the morning, but the windows are west facing or south facing and your meetings in the afternoon, you may have a completely different lighting condition that you need to deal with that maybe you didn't anticipate. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about how acoustics and lighting and things to look for and to listen for um, when, you, when you're evaluating your spaces. What do we have next, Eric? Well, we're gonna move into the equipment phase uh, and talk about the equipment that goes into the environments. Um, I don't see any current questions. No, I can't see any coming in, in so. Eric. Um, just okay. to confirm, I think we're okay. All right, then we will move into evaluating your systems and the types of the types of systems that you'll want to look at. All right. So 
sound systems are used, there are uh, several different purposes for sound systems. One is for voice reinforcement, and that's the talker. And when we talk about um, event technology, we try to create a distinction in our speech, in our speaking between a talker and a speaker. We, you know, generally when you say, well, the speaker said this, well, actually the speaker is an electronic device. The talker said this and the speaker reproduced it. So with that distinction aside, um, sound systems are critical for voice reinforcement so people can understand each other. And that can go not only from the lectern to the audience, but also amongst audience members and from the audience back out to the, to the presenter. We look at all those paths, communication paths, but also now we have virtual presenters and we have virtual attendees. And just like we're doing today, um, this is a sort of a hybrid event. So the voice reinforcement is a critical part. And that's when we measure the intelligibility with our instrumentation, that's what we're measuring for. Um, it also has um, program audio. So program audio coming from either a, um, a YouTube or a Vimeo or some kind of instructional video that's being played or a DVD. So any program audio associated with um, the event, any Farsight, if somebody is asking a question, so Farsight with video conferencing or Zoom meetings when, when the voice of someone who is not physically present in the room needs to be understood by everyone. And then background music or walk-in music or for social events of sound systems have a variety of different um, purposes and when we evaluate um, built-in systems we need to evaluate their effectiveness for all the different um, types of uh, applications. Um, projection and direct view displays we try to create a distinction um, between the, the two basic technologies. Direct view means it's something that you look directly at the, the viewing surface and there's no uh, the, the viewing surface generates the light that you're looking at, whether that's a LED wall or a flat panel display um, using LCD or L, um, OLED type uh, technology, a flat panel direct view display. Uh, projection is where, of course, you have a ceiling or a cart mounted projector and you're shining light onto it. Now, I think we all understand that projection technology is um, dated and um, we've been through 20 years of a whirlwind of changing technologies that have kind of conditioned us to think that um, technology is complex and expensive but the the flat panel technology now is getting very reliable um, reasonably priced, very high quality, and it's all been driven by the consumer market. So we're seeing more and more and more um, designers and developers of facilities building flat panel displays into every one of their meeting rooms and where, wherever they can support that size. The size of the image is, is critical for legibility, which is the ability to read text and to tell the difference between a B and a three and an eight and an H if you're asking people to understand what's on that image. And there, there are guidelines as to how large that display needs to be. Um, roughly the vertical dimension of the display should be one sixth of the distance from the display to the person who's furthest away from that display that you expect to be able to read it. And the front row, the closest um, viewer, should be no closer than two times the vertical dimension. So those are things that we could include in a in a little handout or something. But um, direct view displays are now the the most reliable and the highest quality type, and they're far less susceptible to those light washout um, problems that we showed in in the earlier. Um, there's one important. Um, critical aspect of direct view displays that we'd like to mention, and that is the glossy surface of the displays. Those, those displays that are consumer grade often have a very glossy viewing surface. None of the professional commercial quality displays that you should consider 
will have a glossy surface. You should always look for anti-glare, non-glare, non-glossy surfaces um, for a much, much higher quality image. Otherwise, the reflections of the windows and other architectural elements in the lighting, that's all just visual noise on the display. Um, we talked a bit about lighting and how you need to be able to have control over the, the architectural lighting um, and also over ambient lighting. You need blackout, the ability to draw blackout curtains on the windows if there are windows in the room. And I know that, that it's very um, desirable to have uh, the ability to have natural light in the room to help the audience feel connected to their planet and, and the environment. Um, but when that natural light becomes uh, challenging to your meeting or your display, you need to be able to control it. And then feature lighting. Feature lighting means to be able to highlight the presenters, um, especially when video is being used, when it's, whether it's being recorded or whether it's part of a video conference. Um, it's, it's critically important to have a, a good quality of lighting, and that generally does not come from your ceiling lights or your, your basic built-in lights. You usually have to think about how you're going to provide some supplemental or feature lighting. Infrastructure and involves the cabling and the connectivity into and around the, the event spaces themselves, the inputs and outputs. Um, show flow refers to how is the room laid out from both the guest perspective as they arrive, what are they presented with, Generally speaking, you want your object wall or your stage to be diagonally opposite of the main guest entry door. But show flow also applies to the back of house. And we walk our developers through an exercise. Okay, we're showing up at the loading dock with a pallet of 10 foot trusses. How do we get those trusses from the loading dock into the ballroom without having to pass through any public area? So show flow is just something thinking in terms of logistics throughout the space. That's what I got for that. Um, the capabilities, what services can be provided with the built-in systems. So it's helpful to understand that um, the built-in systems, I guess we're talking about the house sound systems, uh, we're talking about built-in display systems, whether that's projection screens and or projectors and or flat panel displays, um, that there are a lot of benefits to having built-in systems. And as I mentioned earlier, there's more and more um, movement amongst our clients, uh, both uh, full-service hotel, luxury hotel, and conference center clients, to want to build this technology, and it's expected by the guest. Um, it's Built-in systems don't need to have a, uh, additional storage. The cabling is fixed. The cabling is in place, so it doesn't get as much damage. When the portable equipment gets moved around a lot, and the cables get plugged in and unplugged. And so built-in systems are more reliable than portable systems. Um, they, they are engineered specifically for the room, so they will typically perform better as far as being able to serve a larger audience and with higher quality. Um, there's, there's, they're safer. If you don't have cables taped across the floor, then there's nothing like that to trip any potential guest. And you don't have to have, if it's built in, you don't have to set up your seats or chairs around the technology. The technology is, is integrated into the interior design. So aesthetics, theft, the risk of having equipment um, damaged or bumped into or, or disappear. Um, all, a lot of reasons, so you need to understand what are the capabilities of our installed systems and how can we maximize those capabilities. Um, are they current? You know, the, the big thing that Eric and I run into most often when we're doing uh, master planning technology surveys for clients is the, the shift that happened about six to eight years ago between analog cabling and digital cabling. That's one of the big things, and it's a, it's a tough thing to to address because it's not inexpensive, and it doesn't have obvious improvement. So it once, but once you make that change, once you get your infrastructure up to the digital standards, so you can now support current technologies, 
then you're good for the next 20 years. <laughs> the way it's done with with the the better quality cat cable and the fiber um, optic cabling. Once you get that infrastructure laid in, um, then then you know that. And it's all designed the way we work. It think in terms of how do I support this additional equipment? How do I what what can I provide using the built-in? And then how how does this design allow for outside AV companies, allow for portable equipment, allow for production companies to come in and connect up to our infrastructure in ways that don't require uh, a lot of cables to be laid in front of doorways or taped across the floor. Um, so these are all parts of the way to look at your system. Where do you want it? And you've already got probably the standard staging and, and the platform layout. Look at that and say, how am I going to get cables from here to there? And I want to be sensitive to time. And I think that we probably ought to hand it over to Eric. Okay. All right. So we spent some time talking about the room and the built-in systems that, that are there. Um, and, and most of the time when we're working in a venue, we have very limited opportunity to make changes there. I mean, you know, if you're lucky enough to come in when it's being built, you can, you, you know, you've got brand new things to work with and you've maybe got some, some say in what goes where. Uh, or if there's a, a refurbishment of systems, you have that opportunity to make changes. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, those are the things we live with. And we either have to work with them or work around them. Uh, and the way we do that are going to be with portable equipment and with procedures and with our staff. So that's that's going to lead us into the rest of our, our topics today. Um, so since we've talked about the built-in equipment, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, portable equipment. Um, and how to evaluate what types of portable equipment that you need for your facility. Because um, what you're going to want to do is you want to develop a list of the portable equipment that are, are required for basic presentation support. And we say basic presentation support because so much of today's meetings are really just that. They're, you know, someone's got a computer image that they need to show, so they need to be able to display. So you, you, we just need to be able to determine what types of equipment is, is that going to be? Is that going to be projection? Is that going to be display? Um, you know, and a lot of that has to do with your spaces. And so you need to be able to look at your space and determine what, what the appropriate portable equipment to use in there is. And then, you know, we want to realize that, you know, nobody Nobody should or needs to own everything. Um, so you're going to want to research local resources uh, if, you're in a, if you're in an area where that is possible. We do have some customers who are very, very remote. So obviously, they need to be able to be a, more self-sufficient. But if you're in an area where you have local resources, then for those things that you need on a uh, less than semi-regular basis, um, you know, it makes much more sense to provide a, 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 you know, find a local resource that specializes in that kind of thing or, or can provide, you know, a, a service package that includes both the advanced equipment and the manpower who can run it um, as opposed to, you know, maybe having some specialists on your staff that are only really doing their specialty, you know, once a month, once every couple months, and then providing basic support or, you know, helping out with tables and chairs or other kinds of things in, in, the, uh, in the interim. And, and you can work with those providers to make, to make pre, you know, prepackaged uh, services that fit within the boundaries of your facility. And when we say that, it's, you know, it's not finding everything under the sun that can possibly be done. It's, it's understanding your customer base and what their needs are and, and, and creating solutions that you can repeat, that you can, that you can, you know, you can do on a regular basis and you understand the tools that are provided and, and, and uh, it's, it's what your customers expect. You know, we, we say, you know, you can get all the technology you want, but if your customers don't need it, uh, it's it's good. It's going to sit in the closet, you know. And we and we often ask the question: Does anybody have smart boards on property? And have they come out of the closet in the last couple of years? Because you know that's a, that's a, a good example of a, a technology that was was you know supposed to be uh, you know the next great thing, but then you realize if if the presenter doesn't know how to use them, that it's it's just not going to get used. Um, and you want to establish with those vendors. You want to establish, um, you know, service level agreements. You know, uh, for you don't you don't want the pricing to change up and down. You, know, you want to make sure that 
you know, if you're going to bring them in, that you've got an arrangement with them where they charge you at a price that allows you to charge the customer uh, a fair price for the customer, but still allows you to make some money if you're in a revenue producing situation. Um, you know, and, and if you're not, if, uh, if you're providing support and maybe a, uh, some type of educational or, or corporate environment, uh, you still need to make that as efficient as possible because, you know, while, while not everyone actually charges revenue, everyone is concerned with expense. So you want to keep those things under control. Um, and also a big thing is, is you know, in, in almost all facilities, uh, this equipment is owned by, you know, the ownership of the facility. It's, and, and, you know, your company is responsible for managing it. That, that might, that might not be true in all cases, but in most places that we've been, you know, there's a, there's an operator and there's an owner and the operator really is responsible for managing the owner's asset and their investment. Uh, and to do that and to be responsible with the owner's uh, equipment, you really have to understand um, what the equipment is, how much it costs, uh, uh, what's it take to repair, what's it take to service. So you want to, you know, this uh, really is critical to have a, an accurate inventory log of all of the asset information. You know, you want to know, uh, you know, when did you buy it? Who did you buy it from? How much did you pay for it? Uh, you know, is it under a, is it still under warranty? Is it new? Is, if it's not, if it is under warranty, who's that warranty with? If, if, if you have a service contract on it, which we really do recommend uh, for a lot of the major components, uh, you know, who is that with and, and when does it expire so that you can manage that? Um, what, really what this boils down to is you don't want to wait for something to break to then have to figure out who to fix it because the longer the asset is down, the longer it's out of service and the more cost will be involved in replacing it uh, for, you know, for, for needs. Can I jump so in here to, and offer one, sure. one more thing? Real Absolutely. Quick? Um, the, a lot of the uh, control systems and digital signal processing systems and video switching systems, the, the things that are part of and have been for the last 15 years part of the modern AV system are actually computers <laughs> and they have control and programming built into their their platform. So the contractor had to write code and, and create screens, touch screens, and, and control logic that is embedded into these pieces of equipment. It's critical for you to have a copy of that original programming in what's called an uncompiled source code format. Because if anything changes in your system, so you get a different projector that now needs to be controlled by the Crestron or the AMX system. If you don't have the uncompiled source code, you can't get any old contractor to make the change. You have to get the original contractor to make the change, or the new contractor has to start from scratch and recode the entire system. So please check when you're looking at inventory, do, do we have the code? Do we have the software in an archival format? for these various pieces. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, that's a very important part. All right, so having, so having accurate records on the owner's assets shows the owner that you're being very responsible in managing their investment. Uh, you know, to, to be able to provide them with reports on, on the value that, they're at, that uh, you know, their investment is, is creating uh, and the, and, and the uh, service records on that request also comes in very handy when it's time to do some refre uh, re refresh of the system or purchase new equipment to be able to look at something and and see well you know here's a piece of equipment that we used repeatedly for five years with no problems whatsoever and here's a piece of equipment that seems to be you know uh, has an issue every six months uh, to, to help guide future uh, purchase decisions okay so I still, I don't see any questions there. So we're going to move into procedures, which is, as we said, it, it, procedures is how your uh, is how your staff is supported. Uh, it's how it's it's how they know what to do. It's how they um, inter interact with both the equipment and the customers. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the primary things and the things we you know as we go to different facilities and see. Um, where where things might be falling a little short is 
uh, you just can't manage what you don't measure. You know, if if you if you if you don't measure AV revenue specifically and just simply say, well, you know, it goes into this banquet other category. When you when the expectation is, uh, you know, well, how much revenue are you making in AV? You, you can't really say. You know, um, the same goes with costs. If costs are being absorbed by other departments, you don't really know the costs involved in in planning these things. So, you know, there are certain there are certain key performance uh, indicators, such as you know, um, in, on the revenue side, it's equipment, it's it's subcontracted equipment, it's you know labor, it's subcontracted labor, it's sale items. Then there's a lot of specialty things that a lot of people don't get involved in. But you know, if, if you, uh, there's you know internet uh, networking and rigging and power and, and a bunch of different other categories uh, that you want to manage what the revenues are and that the same as you want to manage the cost because you want to be able to keep costs in line uh, you also want to be able to identify specific um, you know uh, revenue and cost categories in reporting uh, because you want to be able to track each of those uh, so this whatever system you're using to manage this whether it's a you know excel spreadsheet or sticky notes or anything you know needs to be needs to take these things into account so that you can you can look at uh for instance you know what what are the costs where uh you know what are the costs in in re-rents you know we're, we're having to rent a lot of things so that you can make purchase decisions based on that and then you want to develop standard reporting to manage all the your operational and your finance thing at the end of a, at the end of a I mean everybody's probably familiar with the end of a financial period you know there's a you know there's a recap and and you know what happened in this period and you know what were what were the costs what were the and the revenues if you're in that kind of facility uh and and because we, you know we all want to we all want to manage we all want to you know the, the the owners want to make money uh the operators want to make money uh, the customers want to pay reasonable pricing, uh, or they want to use the facility that they, you know, own in an efficient manner. And you want to budget for all these things, uh, you, you know, as, as far as as far as cost goes. You know, don't want you don't want the repairs to be a surprise. You want to you know have a have a budget for costs for repairs and maintenance. And that's where service contracts can come in because it's a very manageable manageable way to budget that. Um, you know, it's 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 money that's that can be easily budgeted. Um, and you want to establish support systems for your people in addition to your equipment. Um, you know, you want to establish a criteria on how to assess the technical staff needs. Um, you know, do you need a technical staff at your facility? Is that one person? Is that three people? Uh, is it more? Uh, is it just, is it, uh, you know, folks in other departments who are cross-trained on how to provide basic services? Uh, and a lot of that goes back into how much time is needed. You know, do you have a lot of installed systems where it's simply turning on and off and adjusting volume, or do you have to set and remove a lot of equipment? You know, that that that's something that goes into how you know how much staff you may or may not need. Um, and then once you once you've established the kinds of staff you need, you want to create a job profile for each type of position. You know, is, do you need a you know is, is it like technician level one, two, and three, or do you you know, potentially need a, you know, a video conferencing specialist? Do you need a, uh, you know, an, an audio specialist for an auditorium that has a, you know, large sound system and multiple microphones? You know, you want to, you want to analyze which one of those needs, because not all, not all AV techs are built the same. You know, they have different, they have different uh, skill sets. Um, and then and you want to I do, Eric. <clears throat> Oh, apologies. Sorry, Eric. I was only going to uh, thought I'd grab a moment of silence uh, uh, just to say as well. If there are any questions that are starting to come about from uh, from all this great information that you and Jeff are sharing, uh, just a reminder to all: do use the chat box if you ask the question to all. Everyone can see the question as well. And then when we get to the close, we'll be able to address any of those questions that are coming about uh, in relation or, or challenges that you're having that are not covered in this. I'm sure. Jeff and uh, and Eric will be pleased to do that. But uh, back back over to you again. Apologies for. Okay, thank you. Now I, I was kind of I, I keep watching for the flashing on the thing to see if anybody <laughs> if anybody's uh, has got right. a question because we want to want to make sure we get to address it. Thanks, Eric. Um, sure. Uh, and then another thing we'd, we'd, we'd like to, to recommend folks is, is to have a formal training program. So many places, you know, have have the training of you know uh, you know. 
Ed learns how to work the system and then he teaches Mike and then Mike teaches Sally and Sally teaches Jason and you know it's like a game of telephone and little bits of pieces of information get lost along the way so you really want to have a formal training program that's established with milestones and assessment assessments along the way uh, and ensure that people people get trained because the expectation you know is going to be that if they're providing a service they know how to support it and and you know, not you know, a, a, a train a lack of a training program not only can disappoint your customer, but it really does make you know, staff it, it it decreases staff satisfaction because they don't feel like they've got the tools and resources they need to provide the service that they know that you want to provide to your customer. Um, another area that often gets overlooked in in training is your sales and planning people. Uh, you know. Often those are non-technical folks. Those are the same people who are in charge of, um, you know, what type of room set the, the, the customer needs, what type of uh, food and beverage might go into the room. You know, they almost never, unless you're in a large facility that has dedicated staff, have a technology background. So you really want to provide them tools and resources to make sure that they're able to do their job, and then they have confidence that they're, you know, that what they have. Uh, planned with the customers is going to actually happen um, successfully. Um, you want to provide them, you know, not just you know, a lot of things. Well, we've got a price list, and we send the price list out to to customers, and you know, that's 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 great that that's that's available. But you know, that, then you're really putting it on your customers to understand what they need, and you're not really providing them a, a consultative, uh, you know, event planning process. Um, you know, so many times we get we we ask details like you know what kind of computer is the customer going to have, uh, as opposed to more an outcome-based question of, you know, um, do, do you have a you know d does does your presenter need to show a computer presentation to your audience, um, and then you know a, a lot of times the planning staff should have information that says well if that's if that's what you're going to to, to need to do. You know, here's the room that you're going in, and here's what's appropriate for that. Um, so they really want to sell service outcomes. They don't want to sell equipment. You know, they don't want to sell projectors and screens and displays and microphones. They just want to sell the ability to have uh, have the presentation be seen in the room, have the uh, speakers be heard appropriately. Uh, so you want to create collateral, such you know, you, you want the pricing guides, but you also want to create service packages that are easy for them to understand and sell even if they don't happen to know every bits and piece that needs to go in there. Uh, and another thing that you want to, you might want to have is, is outside provider guidelines. And that's simply to protect the facility in case the, you know, they say, well, we're going to bring in our own AV. I said, okay, well, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Here are the rules for that AV company to follow. That just to, and there's information on there that, uh, that, that that company is useful, that, that's useful to that company. Like, okay, uh, here's our loading dock and here's the path to where you want to go. And here's how you make arrangements to, to stop, you know, to, to bring your stuff to the loading dock. And, you know, here's security office and you want to check in with them and all of, all of that kind of information in the planning process. Um, and then on the operational side, you want to be able to know where equipment is. Uh, so you want your asset management system to also be able to tell you how many things you have available for a particular meeting and, and to identify when something is short. Uh, and you want to be able to look at, uh, you know, is, is you, you want to be quickly and easily be able to look at, is my inventory in good condition? You know, what might need to be replaced? What, uh, what is getting near the end of its service life? Um, and, and one way to make sure that that's prolonged is to identify and set up storage areas to have have a reasonable amount of space to store equipment so it's not crammed in on top of each other. It can be <laughs> clean, secure, and the the environment it's in is climate controlled, so it's not it's not you know being stored outside in a shed, you know, and you're in Arizona where it's 110 degrees outside, and then you're bringing it to an air conditioned room that's 71 degrees uh, in that amount of time because that really does not work. Uh, well for electronic equipment. Uh, you also want to be able to ha have, uh, you know, resource scheduling. You know, understand what is needed, when it's needed, and that's that's really the key to efficient services. So your system should be able to forecast equipment needs and look at required resources. You know, instead of having it become a surprise the day of the event, you know, you want to know a week out that you need an extra projector or an extra display or an extra screen on a particular day. Uh, you want that 
uh, you want your system to be able to identify shortages or things that you don't have an inventory at all and and recommend that you know, hey you know in a week you need this would you like to cross rent it from someone um, you know you, and you need to, then when you do that you need to be able to track that cost to make sure it's associated with that customer uh, so that again you know it, it's all it's you know it's all about profitability it's all about making sure that you know uh, costs are accounted for and controlled as best as possible um, and then you want to obviously create SOPs that train the staff on all of this stuff uh, and all the systems that have been created in order to do that so that they know what what it is and how to use it and, and have all of that available to them. And then, of course, there's the staff. Um, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit about this, but, you know, you need to be able to determine, you know, do you need dedicated staff or is non-technical staff okay to provide the service that you need to provide? Um, if you do need dedicated staff, who's going to hire them? You know, who's going to determine what qualifications are needed? You know, what, what types of equipment are they going to be able to support? What types of services are they going to be able to support? Uh, and then if you do have, you know, whatever staff it is, whether it's non-technical or technical, are you providing ongoing training resources for both the existing staff as well as new hires? So, you know, lots of times we think about, well, we have to train the new hires. But, you know, it's it's often about developing people as well. Whether they're technical or non-technical, they still, you know, need to have, you know, developmental tools. You know, so you know they could, there's always a possibility of learning more and being able to support um, you know higher higher end events whether that's a you know someone who starts as a basic technician and works their way up or whether that's someone who starts as a houseman and decides he likes technology and wants to to move into that or simply someone who decides that uh, you know that's something that she would like to know how to do uh, and and even if they're not a, a technical person and have no plans to go into that it's it's still uh, advantageous to have uh, ongoing training resources so that people can uh, can develop their own skills. And then of course you need to evaluate new technologies and understand what's coming down the road so that you're prepared for it instead of playing catch up. Um, you know, like a lot of people are, are doing now with, with uh, making sure they have those digital inputs, uh, you know, the, um, instead of you know, seeing that coming and, and being able to head that off. Um, and then, of course, you know the, the the whole reason for all of this is to be able to provide the desired guest experience. You know, uh, do the, the capabilities of your staff align with the the complexities of your systems? You know, do do you have complex systems and and staff that does not use them, or do you have staff with a lot of experience who don't have really anything to do after ten o'clock in the morning? Um, you know, um, are there are, are is there here's here's one that we see a lot is there are there systems that only one person on the property knows how to operate is there that one guy who knows how to do that and if something happens and he's out sick that day uh things can go wrong quickly um, you know or do you, do you again do you are are there staff that are you know they're busy at 10 o'clock in the morning and then at five o'clock to put everything away and they're not doing much in the meantime you know those are kind of the, the staff productivity things to measure and look at uh, and then again, you know, if, if you know how much staff you need, also goes plays into it, you have a lot of built-in systems, or do you have a lot of portable systems that need to be set up and taken down every day? So those are the ways, those things to look at to evaluate whether or not you have, uh, uh, you know, the appropriate staff to to manage and provide the service that you want to provide. All right. So to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've talked about the, you know, resp you know, what makes a responsive AV service operation. You know, you, you, it's it's you know, understanding the environment. It's making sure that the, you know you have uh, a, you're responsibly managing your, your owner's asset for for both the built-in and the portable equipment that that they have. Uh, that you're measuring your financial performance, whether it's a revenue generating or not. You're measuring um, you know everything that you need to measure in order to make sure that your the service as efficient and productive as possible. Uh, you, want to, you want to be able to supplement your on-site staff um, with, with training, with uh, you know, uh, the vendor support for higher level needs that it doesn't make sense to have people on property to do. Uh, you want to be able to make sure that they're provided with solutions for challenges uh, and, and that you have the ability to identify and, re and solve reoccurring issues. You know, uh, you're almost never going to, there's always going to be something that comes up that's a new challenge uh, that uh, um, you know, needs, to be, needs to be handled. 
Uh, it just happens in this business. But you know, to have the same thing pop up over and over again, you know, those are those are the things that need to be addressed and dealt with. Um, you know, you make an ongoing commitment to training and educational support of the staff. Uh, it creates both a better guest experience and a better, uh, you know, employee satisfaction. Um, and then thoughtful evaluation of new technologies as they come, you know, and, and I'd be able to identify, yes, that's a great new technology, but it's not really applicable to the type of business that we have, or we have this type of business, um, you know, what, what type of technology the customers, the customers are asking for this, so I need to do some research to figure out what, uh, what's available that would fulfill that need. Because you know, in the end, we're, you know, whether, whether you, you know, no matter what kind of facility you're in, it's, it's all about customer satisfaction. You know, we're here to provide a service. We're here to provide an experience. And, you know, if, you know, the, the better the experience, the, the better the, the, the customers will react. And the, you know, the, the more, the more profit or, um, you know, expense savings there is for all. Okay, uh, so I've tried to keep my eye out for uh, questions along the way, but I think we've run right up to a little over time allotted. So to be respectful of that, uh, certainly I'm willing to uh, continue and ask any questions, but also uh, you know feel free to uh, to reach out after the webinar, uh, or if you're going to the IAC conference in Toronto, uh, I will be there. Be happy to talk to anyone uh, you know one on one about any of these topics. Um, or uh, uh, shoot, shoot an email after after the fact. Um, I'm looking, I don't see any questions at the moment. Uh, Eric, hi, this is Mark. Uh, just mm -hmm. wanted to check, I know we will follow up with, with specific details to everybody on the call, but just remind us what is your email address for anyone who wants to drop you a quick request to take the conversation uh, further. Okay, start. yeah, I should have, did I put that? I did not put that on the end slide. I meant to and I didn't. Uh, my email address is, is my first initial, you see there my name, my first initial E and then my last name, B-R-A-C-H-T uh, at Avastar, which is A-V-A-S-T-A-R dot I-O. 